have the power to change the world. The best ideas can improve our understanding of our universe, our way of life, and ourselves. This is why we need the right to freedom of expression, so everyone is free to express their ideas through speech, art, and writing. But this freedom is often threatened, sometimes by governments and sometimes by other people. For instance, in South Africa, the apartheid government censored newspapers and banned things it disliked, like books and films challenging the idea of racial superiority. It also introduced a law that let it silence people opposed to apartheid by banning them, which prevented their ideas and works from being broadcasted or distributed, and even prevented these people from meeting with more than a few people at a time. All of these measures were designed to prevent the spread of ideas. But through the Bill of Rights enshrined in our Constitution, we now all enjoy the right to freedom of expression, which includes the right to receive and impart information. Knowing what our government is doing is necessary to hold it to account, which is why repressive governments almost always try to control and censor the media. So the right includes freedom of press, so people can be kept informed about things that are happening in the country and the rest of the world. It includes art, because some art challenges aspects of society and shines light on abuses of power. Anyone and everyone has the right to openly object to art or content that they find offensive and harmful, but not in a way that is violent and not in a way that prevents others from engaging with the material. So in our case, we were never against people disagreeing with the film, but what was unacceptable was that violence and hate speech were being used to express their opinions. Ngeba was originally rated as 16 for language, violence and sex. A small faction of traditionalists openly protested the film. The Film and Publications Board Tribunal unlawfully reclassified the film to X18, which meant that the film needed to be removed from cinemas and any other public exhibition channels. It was effectively banned or censored. It also includes academic freedom, as research helps us understand our world and progress our thinking. But speech which causes harm to people or they dignity is not protected by our constitution, such as the sort which might incite violence, advocate hatred, especially on the basis of Welcome everybody, it's Wednesday and my name is Kathy Hasty, and today we are going to be doing life sciences. Okay, we have the next hour to help you as much as we can, but all of this is brought to you by Liberty. They're in it with you to make sure that you get the best possible metric results. Then guys and girls, don't forget to download your Tenfold Education app. It's got a tutor function to submit questions. It's got a whole bunch of stuff. So just download the app. It's also brought to you by Liberty. Then 
Don't forget our WhatsApp number. We've got little Dex, our bot, who's going to be waiting there to get your questions. Make sure you take your questions, take a neat photo on a flat surface because if the questions aren't good, we can't use them. Okay, so they must be clear. And then last but not least, our YouTube channel. So all you do is type in at Mindset Learn and videos of all the things that we do here are available for you to use for your revision. So there you go. And today, our quote of the day is from a great human being, Nelson Mandela. And he said, it always seems impossible until it's done. Okay? And that is going to be with a whole number of things in your life. It's always going to seem impossible. But remember, anything worth doing is worth putting the effort into. So there you go. Alrighty, let's have a look at our first question. Okay, we have a question from Junior, uh, let me just put my glasses on, Junior Louvavio else, and he has sent in this one. Now, the, immediately when you see this diagram, this diagram is a phylogenetic tree. And what it does is it, or a cladogram, and it shows the evolutionary relationships between hominids, okay? So before we just go on to anything here, what is a hominid? And I'm going to zip this down all the way so I can just go through a couple of issues here. Firstly, because learners tend to confuse this, hominids are your modern and extinct great apes, uh, ape, uh, blah, 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 apes plus humans. So that is what hominids are. So when you see a phylogenetic tree of hominids, it's going to include at least one of the great apes, it's normally a chimpanzee, all right? Then we have hominins, and hominins, not does, so it's got an N here, not a D. Hominins refers to modern and extinct human species. Okay, and those are going to be, for example, you're going to have Homo, the first one was Homo habilis, and then from Homo habilis, we ended up with Homo, er, or Homo erectus evolved, and then from Homo erectus, we ended up with um, Homo Neanderthalensis, and from that we ended up with Homo sapiens. Okay, now something just to remember Homo hab, oh, sorry, not habilis, it's hab, hab b, I mean I. Why did I put an A there? Thinking of habitat. Habilis. Homo habilis is known as the tool man because that's where tools started. They found tools with the Homo habilis fossils. Then we have Homo erectus. They're the guys that were the first to use fire. Okay? Then Homo neanderthalus, well, nothing other than they were the ones that moved north and out of Africa, and then you have Homo sapiens, and this is where they were the first to bury their dead. And these are things they're going to expect you to know in an exam. So when they talk about hominids, it's going to include the great apes. If they talk about hominins, they're talking about the human species, which are all the Homo species. Okay. And then toolman, habilis, 
fire was erectus, Neanderthalensis, they're the guys that moved, and we get Homo sapiens, they were the first to bury their dead, which all shows a progression in development and a, um, a change in the evolutionary process. Okay, so let's go back here. What am I doing? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, looking at this now, we've got the hominids. So why? It includes the chimpies here. What does this phylogenetic tree owe? The dotted line indicates the species is extinct. So out of all of these, we've still got chimps around and we've got Homo sapiens around, which is us. Okay, now, if we look here, this was a common ancestor of the chimps and everything else. Then this common ancestor here ended up with Ardipithecus, and you ended up with your Australopithecines. So there was Am 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 Amanensis and Afarensis and Africanus. But now look at this. This common ancestor here ends up branching into Australopithecus, Paranthropus, and Homo sapiens, and to Australopithecus and Paranthropus, uh, 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 I'm sorry, Paranthropus robustus. This was, so they have a common ancestor. These guys have a common ancestor. And these have a common ancestor. And those have a common ancestor. So if we look here, Australopithecus was our common ancestor at this point. And from Australopithecus, we then end up with Homo sapiens coming down this way. We are not related uh, um, directly to Paranthropus, okay? We are a branch there and there. So, as we look at this, what have you got? If we look at the, the capital letters represent the genus, and the lowercase words represent the species. Species is always lit, written with a lowercase, where the genus is written with a capital. One genus and many genera. Okay? So, if we look at the number of, of, of uh, genuses that we have here, or genera that we have here on this uh, um, phylogenetic tree, we have one, two, three, four, five. If they ask you, the, which they do, the number of hominids, uh, um, hominins that we have, hominins would be the ones that end up being part of the extinct human species. So, there's your timeline. This is back, say, five million years, and we say they are Maya, and this would be present day. So this would be zero. Okay, that's present day. So we're working towards present day. Okay, what is this type of diagram called? I've already told you it's a phylogenetic tree. Or you can call it a cladogram. But phylogenetic tells you it's the different, the, the different genetic processes and, and, and organisms that are related. List the different hominin genera shown in the diagram. Well, I can tell you now, they want the hominin, which means those that are of not the great apes, the human process. So you're going to start off with Ardipithecus. I'm not going to write them out. It's, it's very easy. So here you go. Um, you're going to have Ardipithecus. Make sure you spell it correctly. Then you have Australopithecus. That's an A, not an O. And then you have Paranthropus. And then you have Homo. Those will be your four genera. Um, okay. Then according to the diagram, which genus is most recently evolved. 
So most recently evolved will be the one that has the last break, and that would be your HOMO. That is the most recent because all the others are extinct. Only HOMO is around. Okay, genus of hominin is the oldest. Well, that's easy. We go up here and we have a look and it's going to be Ardipithecus. Okay, that is the oldest because here Ardipithecus would have existed at this point and none of the others existed at that point. Okay, so it would be Ardipithecus. Pathecus. Okay, they want the genus. So don't go and put Ardipithecus and then whatever it was. It's Ardipithecus because they only want the genus, not the species as well. And remember, you write it with a capital letter. The species is written with a lowercase. Okay, then your hominin species, uh, uh, hang on, let's switch. According to the diagram, which hominin species share a common ancestor with Australopithecus africanus? So all we do is we go back here and we find Australopithecus africanus is there. And which, uh, um, who do they share a common ancestor with? It will be Paranthropus robustus. So we can put just P for Paranthropus and you put a full stop and then Rho... Bustus. And again, remember the species name with a lowercase letter. All right, give two examples of Australopithecus fossils. I mean, Australopithecus africanus fossils found in South Africa. People, you must know these. It is Mrs. Pless. Okay, and Mrs. Pless. And the second is the Tung child. Okay, and both of those fossils were found at the Stirk Fontaine Caves. Okay, so you must know this. This is something that you must know, you must learn it. So your Australopithecus Africanus fossils for South Africa is Mrs. Place and the Tong Child, and they are at the Stirk Fontaine, or they were found at the Stirk Fontaine Caves. And then it says, name two homo species besides homo sapiens that were found in Africa. Well, that's easy. It is homo, so H, habilis, okay, our little tool man. And it was homo erectus. All right. So that's, they were both found, or those, those two genus of fossils, I mean species of fossils, were found in Africa, not South Africa specifically. And then something else I just want to help you to remember is that only, this is part of the, the out of Africa hypothesis, only found in Africa. Okay, only found in Africa, number one. We've got R de P -P fossils. They're not found anywhere else, only in Africa. Secondly, we've got um, Australopithecus. I think I spelled that wrong. Australopithecus. You see, this is what happens. <laughs> we got check here. Austra it is Australopithecus. So I'm right. Australopithecus fossils. And your third one that is only found in Africa is Homo habilis. These little fossils are not found anywhere else in the world, only in our beautiful continent. And then something else that you must know or that they could ask um, in prelims and in finals is the oldest 
fossils. The oldest ones. So the oldest Homo erectus and the oldest Homo sapiens. Okay. Um, found in Africa. And this is why they say it is the out of Africa hypothesis. Right. So the oldest fossils, you, that we don't only find erectus and, and, and sapiens here in South Africa, I mean in Africa. They found everywhere, but your oldest ones are from Africa. But, but, your Ardipithecus, your Australopithecus, and Homo habilis, they are only found in Africa, and there you go. Okay. Guys, we're going to our next question. So, what is in store for us? Let's have a look. And here is our next question. So, if we take a look here, and this is also from Junior. Junior's really been sending in questions. Okay, the diagram below represents two types of shrimp. Each type lives in shallow seas on opposite sides of a strip of land. Now, the minute you see you've got two types of shrimp, there's A and there's B, and there is a strip of land, this is a geographical barrier. Okay, it's a geographical barrier. So, the minute you see a, ge a geographical barrier, you know what? You are going to be talking about speciation. Okay, and we've got type A and we have type B. All right, now, an investigation to determine whether two types of shrimp were from one species. Okay. The scientists placed shrimp type or type A shrimps and type B shrimps together in a tank of seawater. So obviously seawater because that's where they live. Although the shrimps mated, hmm, and here we go, with their own types, so either A or B, the two types of shrimps did not mate with each other. Therefore, they are different species. Remember, what is a species? And you must know this definition. A species is a group of organisms that look the same, <coughs> have the same DNA sequence, okay, um, are able to interbreed and finally produce fertile offspring. Are they interbreeding here? No, they're not. And if they do not interbreed, that means that they are different species. Okay. The scientists repeated the investigation. That's going to talk to reliability of the experiment. Okay. Remember, validity is when they keep the things the same. So anything that has the same water, the same food, the same, 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 that would all be validity. It's to make the experiment that or the investigation valid. But when they repeat or they um, use a larger sample size in any kind of investigation, then they're talking to reliability. Okay, so... Give one conclusion the scientists came to after this investigation. Your conclusion is here. They wanted to prove that two types of shrimp were from one species, but when they didn't mate with each other, they were from a different species. So what is the conclusion that they came to? The two types of shrimp belonged to the two different species.
species. Or you could have said shrimp type, a type A shrimp and type B shrimp are different species. Doesn't matter how you put it, you had to say that both the two, the, or the two types of shrimps are not the same species because they did not inter uh, explain your answer. Um, type A and type B shrimp did not mate with each other. And there you go. End of story. Easy peasy. Why did the scientists repeat the investigation purely for reliability? That's it. Okay. Next. Describe our species. Oh, guys, listen. You must know <coughs> speciation through geographical isolation. Okay. That's when you have a barrier. Now, I'm going to give you all the points you need. It's normally six marks, not five, by the way. Okay? Um, here they gave five marks for this question, but it's normally a six-mark question. So here we go. Okay. I'm going to put bullet points so that you understand where the sentences are. If a population... becomes separated by a geographical barrier. And you can like sea, lake, river, mountain, Okay, I'm just putting that there so to help you. By a geographical barrier, the population is split into two. Okay, so that's one mark already, that's another mark already. Okay, so what happens then? There is no gene flow. between the two populations. I'm just going to write pop, okay, because it's long. So there is no gene flow, okay, split into two, become separated. So there's another mark. So there's no gene flow. Now, the thing is that each population is exposed to different environmental conditions. So on either side of that barrier, they're going to have different environmental conditions. So what does that mean? We now go to Darwin's theory. So natural selection occurs independently in each population. Okay? All right. So, they're exposed to different environmental conditions. Tick. Natural selection occurs independently. Tick. So, we've already got six marks. But you have to give all the points. So, this results... results in both um, becoming genotypically, and I'm going to squish this up, and phenotypically different. Okay? So genotypically in the genes and phenotypically what they're going to see, what you're going to see, different, okay? If or when the two 
populations are mixed again. They will not interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Okay? Um, won't interbreed, won't produce fertile offspring, and you then finish your little piece by saying the two populations um, have <clears throat> now become two different species. Done and dusted. Okay, so one population, a barrier occurs, a drought, a volcano, whatever. There is a physical geographical barrier. You've got species A, you've got species B, I mean population A, population B. They cannot interbreed because there's this barrier in between. Okay, so what happens? They now are in different environments with different conditions. And what happens? you are going to have natural selection occurring on this side and on this side. So what is natural selection? That is, each population is variation. And those with, the, with, with favorable characteristics survive and they will interbreed and pass those genes on to the next generation. So that more of the next generation or a greater percentage carry those good favorable genes. The, those with the unfavorable genes die. And the same happens on this side. So natural selection occurs. So that they end up being completely genetic, genotypically and phenotypically different. So when you look at them, they may look similar, but they're not the same. Okay? And you can't see what's in the genes, but the genes become different. So what happens? The two populations, when you put them together, they're not going to interbreed. Why? because they're not the same species. Because to be the same species, they must be able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Okay, done and dusted. We're going to go for an ad break, and I'll see you all in a minute. No one ever asks why we do the weird things we do. Like, why once is never enough? Or doing two trips is just one too many? Why do we, before we use these, or say five, when we mean twenty? Why do we have second thoughts? And think that lift buttons make them go faster? Why don't we walk there? Cross our fingers, touch wood, and struggle to hide our true feelings. At Liberty, we want to know all the weird and wonderful things that make us human. Because human beings, being human, are what we make financial solutions for. Liberty, in it with you. There is a valley in Panama where the trees have square trunks. Anton Valley in Panama is situated on the second largest dormant volcano in the world. But what is really interesting is that some of the trees appear to have square trunks. Some people believe this anomaly arises because of the unique composition of the soil in Anton Valley. But scientists aren't exactly sure.
when I get back home, I'm going to check about those square trunks. I really want to see where, how, what. Okay, guys and girls, welcome back. Uh, a huge shout out to Liberty. This is all brought to you by them because they're in it with you for a decent, awesome exam result. And then don't forget you to download your Tenfold Education app. It has got a tutor function. It's got stuff for you on math, science, and life sciences. And it's, it's also, you can live stream on it. And then don't forget our little WhatsApp number with our little botty decks. Send in your questions. Make sure they are good questions and exciting questions. And then don't forget the YouTube channel. Just go in and type in at Mindset Learn and you can select any of the videos from your teachers here on Tenfold Education. Okay, our live show. Righty, so let's see. Okay, we have our next question. And this question also from Junior. The diagram below represents the distribution of chromosome pair 21. Now people, by now you should know that chromosome pair 21 causes Down's syndrome. Okay? All right. It's, that's why Down's syndrome is also called trisomy 21. Okay? It's when you have tri, three, somy, chromosomes. Trisomy 21. Okay, now, it appears in the gametes at the end of meiosis 2. We know this is meiosis 2. Why? Because we're clever enough to know that there are four unidentical daughter cells resulting here. And it's in the human male. Now, one of the things that people tend to, to mistake or make a mistake about is that only women are the cause of Down syndrome uh, um, offspring. It is not true. Down syndrome in females is increased. The chances of it is increased as to 1 in 12 for women over the age of 40. Okay? It's as we get older and go towards menopause. But Down, synd uh, Down syndrome or your, or your uh, um, incorrect gametes, can be caused by males as well. It's not just a female thing, okay? It is whenever meiosis occurs in a male, in the testes, or in a female, in the ovaries. So it can either be a sperm cell or an ovum, all right? So um, I, I know that uh, uh, I have had other questions that have come up, and people have said, but males, males can't cause it. M males don't have things like this happening. Yes, they do. Wherever meiosis is going to take place, it can occur. Okay, so here we go. It says, explain why. Okay, so first of all, let's have a look here. We have got, now remember, it's chromosome pair 21. So what would have happened? Let me see. Okay, let's just go down, down, down. I need space, 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 space. What would have happened is we're now only talking about the chromosome number 21 or homologous chromosome 21. So you're going to have a chromosome and a chromosome, okay, from 21. I, I'm not drawing the male sex here, hey? I'm drawing a, 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 a replicated chromosome. So there are two replicated chromosomes. This one is a paternal chromosome. Man, you know what? Let me just start again. Let me make this a bit bigger so I can write. Okay, so... So there's chromosome 1 and chromosome 2, okay? Both of these are homologous pair number 21, okay? This one will be your paternal chromosome. And this one is the maternal chromosome. OK, 
okay? And after crossing over, this one will contain, uh, this one will contain a little piece and let's make this one orange. Okay, so after crossing over, the paternal chromosome will carry a piece of the maternal and the maternal chromosome will carry a piece of the paternal. All right, now we're going to have meiosis 1 occurring. Okay, and during meiosis 1, instead of this homologous pair separating into two separate chromosomes, they go across as a pair. Okay? And in this side, we've got nothing. All right, now... <coughs> after this, we now have meiosis 2 taking place. And at the end of meiosis 2, remember at the end of meiosis 1, we have two unidentical daughter cells. At the end of meiosis 2, we now have four unidentical daughter cells. This one will have nothing in it. That one's got nothing in it, which is what they drew. This one will have... What am I doing? This one will have that, and, and this one will have, okay. Okay, there you go. Why? Because this little guy went in here, that little guy went in there, and everybody's happy. Okay, this is what you were seeing. And this, where your two chromosomes in the homologous pair, don't separate out during anaphase one, okay, here, during meiosis one, anaphase one of meiosis one, they join, they stay together. So instead of having your double row during metaphase and you've got your different chromosomes going to opposite poles, You've got both of these went to one pole and the other went to, had nothing. So this pole gets nothing and this pole gets two. All right, that is what's happened. So let's go back here and we say, right, that's what we've got here now. This, what you are seeing here, is what we would have had in our cells. So explain why the gametes presented by C and D do not have any chromosomes. Okay, now what we are going to say is that non-disjunction. Now people, when they ask you questions on meiosis, they, get, they ask you the different phases, so you must know what happens in meiosis one and what happens in meiosis two, okay? So you must be able to recognize it. So if they show you a diagram, you must know, okay, that's telophase one, that's telophase two, that's prophase one, that's prophase two. Um, so you must be able to recognize the phases. That's number one. Number two, they're going to ask you about crossing over. And number three, they can ask you about non-disjunction. That's all they can ask you in meiosis. So learn that. That's all. You don't have to learn all the other stuff, just that. And then, of course, the significance of crossing over. Because remember, during meiosis, crossing over and uh, um, uh, independent assortment during metaphase one and metaphase two is responsible for genetic variation. That you must know. Okay, so here we go. So we're going to have non-disjunction of what? Of chromosome... Pair, or you can actually just say homologous chromosome. Chromosome pair number 21 during when? I told you, during anaphase one. Okay, 
anaphase one, because if it happened during anaphase two, we were going to still have something in the, the, the other two gametes. So anaphase one results in both, and that's important, both chromosomes being pulled to one pole and none being pulled to the other pole. Okay, because that's what the well, that's what your your uh, um, uh, uh, spindle fibers do. They pull during anaphase. They pull the chromosomes to the opposite poles. During metaphase one, you have a double row of chromosomes because your homologous chromosomes all line up at the equator as a double row. Okay, so what happens? is that the chromosomes should separate from the homologous pairs and they are randomly pulled to opposite poles so that you've got a mixture of, of, of paternal and maternal chromosomes on this side and a mixture of maternal and paternal chromosomes on this side. Okay, so that the two gametes that result are different. Okay, so what do we have now? Then during metaphase two, you have a single row of chromosomes, all right? And those single row of chromosomes now split apart at the centromere into daughter chromatids, I mean to, to chromatids, or what we call daughter chromosomes. And they will then form. So what's happened here occurs during anaphase one. So it results in both chromosomes pulled to one pole and none being pulled to the other pole. And there are your three marks, that's one, two, three, and done and dusted. Thank you for three easy marks. Oh my goodness, a gimmete, it's a gamete. So it's a, a gamete. A, if gamete A is involved in fertilization, describe how this may result in Down syndrome. So let's see here. So gamete, it doesn't matter if it's gamete A or gamete B, it's gonna be the same answer, okay? So what have we got? We're going to have, remember, two chromosome 20, 21s there. So we say gamete A contains 24 chromosomes. When fertilization occurs, with a normal um, ovum. Because remember, we're talking about a male, hey? So this would be in the sperm cell, your 24 chromosomes. So when fertilization occurs with a normal ovum, okay, containing 23 chromosomes, because that's what's normal, because remember, we have 23 from the ovum plus 23 from the little sperm cell, and that is going to give us the 46 chromosomes that are normal. So containing 23 chromosomes, the zygote, which is the result of it, the zygote will have three chromosomes number 21 and a total of 47 chromosomes. Okay, why? You've got those three. Instead of having two, you've got three. So you've got 24 plus you have 23 is gonna give you 47. And when it is three chromosome number 21s, we call that, listen, this is all extra stuff, hey? We call that trisomy, tri meaning three chromosomes, trisomy 21, which will always cause Down syndrome.
Okay, that is what Down syndrome is. All right, so let's carry on. Okay, due to the process of crossing over, the chromosomes, it, mm, what am I doing here? Due to the process of crossing over, let me get yellow, um, the chromosomes in diagram A and B appear different to each other. Oh, yay. I mean, clearly, they've swapped. Okay, so identify the phase. It is pro men. <laughs> pro phase one. There is no crossing over in pro phase two. You've already swapped the genetic material. So pro crossing over only occurs in pro phase one. And that's how you're going to identify pro phase one versus pro phase two. Pro phase one, you'll actually see crossing over. Pro phase two, you'll see the, the, the uh, uh, centrioles, you'll see spindle fibers, and you'll just see the chromosomes sitting around individually. All right, so describe the events during crossing over. Okay, they, they like asking this question in an exam, hey? So make sure that you know it. So let's do it in a point form. Firstly, so homologous chromosomes. You mustn't use points in an exam. I'm using this so that you can remember each point. Homologous chromosomes line up next to each other. Now remember, Homologous chromosomes are chromosomes that are the same length, size, and shape. They have centromeres in the same position, and they carry the same alleles in the same positions on, on, on uh, um, or in the same location, or locus on the chromosome. So on, on the paternal chromosome, if you have the the allele for a dimple in the cheek here, you'll have an allele for dimples in cheeks on this side. If you have an allele for a size six shoe on this side, you've got the same on that side. And I'm being ridiculous, but blue eyes, blue eyes, or blue eyes and brown eyes. But the eye allele will sit in the same place on the paternal and the maternal. Okay, they carry the same alleles. Okay, so your homologous chromosomes line up next to each other. Okay, your non-sister chromatids um, cross over at a point called the Chiasmata. Okay, now, the chiasmata is the point where they touch. So I just want to quickly do it here. If I have, I've got my chromosome. Okay, so I'm going to do that as one. And I'm going to do the other one here. So that's maternal, and this is the paternal chromosome. They are homologous chromosomes. They're the same. They're the same length, blah, 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 blah. Centromeres in the same position, etc. Okay, so these are your homologous chromosomes, and they line up next to each other, and then they move so that they are touching. And that point where they touch, that is called your chiasma. Okay, and what happens is they then swap DNA. And when they swap the DNA, this maternal chromosome now has a piece of the paternal chromosome, and the paternal chromosome now has a piece of the maternal chromosome. Okay, and that is what, what assists with the whole genetic variation process. Okay, so now, the third point, segments of DNA are swapped. We can say exchanged, but swapped is such a nice word. They swapped and then they join together. So, recombination. 
nation um, and men. I was going to say any a combination occurs and recombined into each chromosome. Okay, so this is what happens here. So this recombination is it's now recombined into this chromosome and this is recombined into this chromosome. That is your recombination. All right, so, and there are your three marks. So it's one, two, three. Thank you for coming and you must know this. Okay, it's one of the few things they can ask you. Then explain the, here we go, the significance of crossing over to natural selection. Now, people, ge genetic variation is caused by five things. It's C, triple R, M, and that's how you remember it. So, the C is crossing over during prophase one when genetic material is swapped between the homologous chromosomes. It's number one. Number two, um, random assortment of chromosomes and chromatids, uh, at least chromosomes, during metaphase one and metaphase two. When those chromosomes line up at the equator, um, all your paternal chromosomes don't go one way and all your maternal the other way. They randomly go to opposite poles. Okay? So that is... Uh, uh, um, C, crossing over. Then we've got RRR, so random assortment at metaphase one and two, random mating, obviously for animals, random fertilization, so which sperm cell is actually going to fertilize that egg cell, and lastly, mutations. Those are the five things that cause genetic variation. And what is natural selection? It's genetic variation. Because there is variation in every single population of organisms and species on this planet. So here we go. So you say crossing over leads to genetic variation. This is NB, 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 NB. You must know this. So genetic a crossing over leads to genetic variation, okay, in what gets made during meiosis, gametes. So you've got your male gametes and you've got your female gametes, okay. Um, it may result, and the reason we say may is because sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on that random fertilization random mating, and, and what sperm cell actually gets to which ovum. Okay, so it may result in alleles for favorable, because that's what natural selection is about. It's those with the favorable traits or char characteristics. They're the ones that survive. So for favorable characteristics, to be transferred uh, uh, it's transferred oh, I spelled it right transferred to um, offspring. Okay. Why? To ensure a better, put a comma there, to ensure a better chance of survival when, when, in by mental conditions change. Okay, remember Darwin's theory of natural selection. What was that all about? 
you've got variation in a population. Those organisms with favorable variations survive. And they pass those favorable alleles on to the next generation. And with each generation, there will be a higher proportion of organisms carrying the favorable trait than those with the unfavorable trait. Those with the unfavorable trait, well, they either get eaten or they die or they can't find food or their necks aren't long enough, whatever the case is, they just don't make it. So if, they, if their characteristics are unfavorable, they die. And if they did, they can't, they can't uh, uh, um, transfer alleles to the next generation because they did. So what happens? You're going to have, with each generation, uh, more and more with a favorable condition surviving until only the ones with a favorable condition survive. That is natural selection. So crossing over, okay, and uh, uh, um, random assortment during metaphase one and two lead to genetic variation in gametes and they may result in the, on, in the alleles for favorable characteristics being transferred to the offspring. That means they're gonna have a better chance to survive when conditions change. End of story. I mean, how easy is that? So guys, and go, is, is there another question here? Let's just see. No, 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 we've answered all the questions. Okay, well, we've got like 23 seconds left. So I just wanna say thank you for joining me. Focus on what you need to know. Okay, also please, which we didn't do today, is make sure that you know the characteristics that are uh, uh, the same and different between humans and African apes. That's, that's imperative. And also make sure that you can explain bipedalism and its advantage. All right, there you go. Enjoy your exams. Make sure that you think before you ink. I'll be thinking of you. Mwah. Welcome to Moby School. We are here to make sure that you, yes, you get all the marks that you deserve on the go. We're here every Mondays to Fridays from 2 to 3 p.m. only on Mindset Learn TV. Now, this is a whole hour worth of revision just for you. And I hope that you've got your notepads and your pens ready and that you and your study group are game for today's revision session. Now, my name is Joe, and just like you, I am also in metric, and I'm here for a whole hour to make sure that I ace my final exams. And I hope that you will be doing the exact same thing. Now, do remember that we love hearing from you guys. 
guys. So log on to our Facebook page, which is www.facebook.com forward slash Moby School SA. Drop us your comments, like our page, um, share the page, and even spread the Moby School family even bigger. Now, isn't that cool? Yep. Yes, it is. Now, do remember that you can catch us here for a whole hour of revision session where all of our awesome teachers come right here to help you guys revise. So on that note of the first revision session, let's head straight to our teacher. Right, so we've, we've looked at this in some detail. Please make sure that you understand the words. I tried to explain some of these words. A puff, I don't think I did puff. Puff is a little poof, poof, poof. A draft is like the wind that comes under a door, so sort of thin wind. Explain that. You need this. It's used more than once. The lecture theater, hum. Hum is hum. So it's the sound of the traffic and the people, that kind of sound. Solemnly, so it's quite a deep sound. And then the footfall as the footstep and the cabinet. Remember, one of the important things of prior knowledge when you read a novel like this one is knowing the words. Because once you understand the words, the story is really not difficult. It's that some of the vocab might be words that you don't know. So every time you look at language, you need to look at vocabulary. You need to write the words down and learn the meanings. If we look at this, this is where Poole and, and Utterson try to, well, they break the door down. Now, you need to understand besieger. In a time when there would be a castle, soldiers would settle around that castle and attack it. They are called the besiegers. And the person inside would be defending the castle walls. So here, this word suggests attack. They are like an army, like soldiers attacking. And they break the door down, and their own riot is their violence. And the stillness that had followed. So what we have is terrible noise, terrible violence, as they break the door down. And they're quite, quite shocked at how they behave. And then silence. So first of all, they take a step back, and then they peer in. So they don't actually walk into the study. They kind of take a step back, because now the door's down, and they've smashed the locks and whatever they've done. And then they kind of come to the door, and they look in. What does it show you? They don't know what they're going to find. They're actually very frightened. And what do we see? There's the study, the quiet lamplight. There's a good fire. It glows on the hearth. So if we've got uh, the floor like this, there will be a place where you build the fire. So this is, and here's the grate. And then the hearth is the stone around the fire. People often, you know, like you might put your mug of coffee there to keep it warm or something like that. That's the hearth. And it glows and it chatters. So it sounds really happy. It's soft. It's a soft fire. And it's kind of chattering. It's talking. And there's a kettle. And the kettle is singing. So the kettle's basically on the boil. So somebody's about to, to make you know, a cup of tea for their tea. Um, and there's a drawer to open. Papers neatly put on the business table. Things are laid out for tea. So he was going to have his tea which could be, you know, tea itself, but a sandwich or some, some meat and potatoes. Tea can be a little bit more like, like a sort of snacky kind of meal. It can be that. It can be steak and egg and chips, actually. It can be tea for, for the Brits. So he's preparing a, a little, like a little supper for himself. And the quietest room, you would have said, and except for the glazed presses full of chemicals, so you've got cupboards with glass in front of them and you can see the chemicals behind, you would have said the most ordinary room that night in London. So look at it. It's like so normal, 
quiet, calm little fire, the kettle, somebody's about to have something to eat. And in the middle, there's the body of this man, twisted, still twitching, but basically dead. So you've got this wonderful contrast. Remember we used the word juxtaposition. So we have a juxtaposition of the room with all the normality, peace, ordinariness, homeliness, and the dead man. So they drew near, they come closer on tiptoe. Notice it's all so quiet, so they stay quiet. And they turn the body over, and it's Edward Hyde. And the clothes are too big. These are the doctor's clothes. The cords of the face, so he's died with the face contorted. You know how the, 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 the things stand out in your neck? He's, he's died like that. Some appearance of life, but he's, he's actually dead. And in his hand, he has a little glass bottle, which he's crushed, and there's the smell of kernels. So he's taken poison. And he's, he's um, drunk this poison, and then the, the body's gone into spasms. <clears throat> spasms. The face is contorted, and, and he's crushed the, the, the glass that, that the poison was in. Right, we finally know Utterson's full name. And you're asked to comment on it. So... We're told that his name is Gabriel John, and we'll come back to Utterson. Gabriel. Okay, so say to yourself, who's possibly the most famous Gabriel that, that we all know? And we'd say the angel Gabriel. What is his role? He brings messages to people. He comes to people, and he tells them the truth. He says to Mary, you're going to have a son, and you're going to call him Jesus. And so this is the angel Gabriel. So a sense of he is a messenger, he gives messages, he sends messages, and he tells the truth. So he, he gets information, he brings information. So this is Utterson, the person that I said was a sleuth, like an amateur detective. John, now there are lots of John. These are both biblical names, so I'm going to the Bible. I mean, it seems a fairly obvious place to go. John, I'm now looking for a John who brings a message and who tells the truth. So I'm going with John the Baptist. Remember, he was the person in the Bible who said, prepare ye a, a way for the Lord, okay? Repent. So once again, he, he does that, he does that. This is also. What I find quite, I don't want to say amusing, but let's say ironic about Utterson's name is to utter means to speak. So why is it ironic? Well, he does speak a lot in this novel. He tells us a lot about what's going on. He tells us what he wants to find out. And he does tell us quite a bit of what he finds out. But there are times when he doesn't utter. Right at the beginning of this book, he never tells us that he knows that, that Hyde is going into the back door of Jekyll's house. He never told us that. Kept it from us. And what you're going to find at the end of the novel is he doesn't utter again. We get Dr. Lanyon's story. We get Dr. Jekyll's story. But Utterson never comments. Utterson never says anything. So that's quite ironic. I think the whole point here is that we as the reader have to make up our own minds about what the message, the theme of this novella is. So there are his names. And I think go with the biblical names because of the strong religious biblical element in the novel. Class of 2021, dreaming big? We're here to help you reach your academic goals. You can now subscribe to the Morby School channel on Ayoba for all your grade 12 help. Get free daily videos and study notes for grade 12. Morby School covers maths, physical science, life sciences, English home and first additional language, and even English set works. You can also join us on Facebook for study and lifestyle advice. And we'll be there to guide you through those crazy exams. Morby School will get you there. Just some authors and some stories. I'm not sure if you've heard of Edgar Allan Poe or Jules Verne. Obviously, you've heard of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. 
I would have expected you to know something of Frankenstein, though lots of people think that Frankenstein is the name of the monster. And no, it's Dr. Frankenstein. So I'm just drawing your attention here to Victorian science fiction and to think about how this novel fits in with the idea of science fiction. So remember your basis of science fiction is you take what science is doing now and you imagine logically what would happen if science were able to do this in 40, 50, 100 years time. That's science fiction. So you work on as scientific as you can, as reasonably scientific as you possibly can, and then imagine what would that, that would be in the future. So science fiction is quite technological. And you need to look at how technological you think your particular novel is. Right, so Dr. Lanyon's narrative goes back and says he got a letter from Jekyll. Jekyll said to him, I need you to go to my house in the middle of the night, fetch something, and go back to your house and wait for a visitor. And that visitor is Hyde. And he mixes uh, a drink, a draft is a drink, and he turns into Jekyll in front of, of Dr. Lanyon. The time is important, I think because for Dr. Lanyon, it was such a shocking thing that happened. And he says on the 9th, four days ago, he received by the evening delivery a registered en envelope. So just remember, in Victorian England, the post was delivered a number of times a day. Um, we rely on, on emails and computers uh, to a large extent. But the post would be delivered. So here you're told evening delivery. So there was a del delivery at night. Dr. Jekyll specifies Dr. Lanyon must be prepared at midnight. So do look at the times. They are quite spooky and creepy. And the places are Dr. Lanyon's house and Dr. Jekyll's house, and where does he have to go? Into a cabinet, and he, into his study. If necessary, you have to break into the study, and you have to get the drawers. All right, it, it really is an important chapter. I said earlier that I assume that everybody knows the story of Jekyll and Hyde. It's been made into so many movies over the years. But if you didn't know the story, here is the point at which you suddenly realize that the two men are the same person. And Lanyon dies. We obviously at this point also know that, that Jekyll Hyde is dead and that he has committed suicide. I still think that we want to know, you know, even even knowing the book as well as I do, I still find these last two chapters riveting because they are so disturbing and so interesting and so uh, weird. So this is Jekyll writing to Lanyon. You are one of my oldest friends. And although we may have differed at times on scientific questions, in other words, we argued about science. I cannot remember, at least on my side, any break in our affection. So he says, I always considered you my friend. There was never a day when, if you'd said to me, Jekyll, my life, my honor, my reason depend upon you. This is your reputation. I would not have sacrificed my left hand to help you. Lanyon, my life, my honor, my reason are all at your mercy. If you fail me tonight, I am lost. You might suppose after this preface, this beginning, that I'm going to ask you for something dishonorable to grant. Judge for yourself. So this importance of honor, reputation, a Victorian gentleman didn't do something which would society would consider wrong. And he's saying, I'm not going to ask you to do anything dishonorable. Just by the way, some of my students ask me why tonight has a hyphen, because it used to. Um, the, the, that's, it, it used to be hyphenated. We just don't use a hyphen anymore. Judge for yourself. Look at the language. 
I want you to mark each one of those words and phrases and notice how Jekyll is trying 